is a little rowdy this morning. How are you? I, I, uh, I just wanted to let you know, I missed all the praise and worship, but I came in at the end. I was doing a special appearance this morning at Children's Church as Captain America. And, uh, you know, everyone, we searched high and low for Captain America, and then everyone said, you know, Pastor Dave, let's be honest, we all know it's you. <laughs> No, I paid my daughter $20 to let me be Captain America in Children's Church. And, you know, I was in there. I just want to tell you, you have the best kids. But I, I also want to warn you that my daughter is way better with children than me because when I go with children, and especially when they're not mine, I give them stuff they shouldn't have. I feed them stuff I shouldn't feed them. And so I tried to sugar your children up a little bit. I made them all swords. They're balloons, but who knows what they could do with them. Because your kids can do all things through Christ with that sword who strengthens them. And, and today, I, I'm excited about today. I'm just going to be really honest. I'm extremely excited about this morning. Uh, I'm excited about what God has placed on my heart to communicate this morning. Because you know, God is a God that is, is so about liberating the hearts of people. He is so about developing an attitude of running the course of your life to moving forward. And, and we see it all through Scripture. But I want to read some Scripture today. I want to read the Hebrews chapter 12. I want to read the very beginning of Hebrews. And then we're going to read the very end of Hebrews chapter 12. And it's a great Scripture. The, the, the beginning, verse 1, is actually one of my favorite Scriptures because it gives us a depiction. It gives us an understanding, maybe a, a, a viewpoint of what heaven sees and how we maybe should perceive not just our life, but how we live our life. And that there are those that have gone on before us to prepare a path for our lives, not just physically, not just um, technology, not just with the ongoing movement of our world, but also spiritually. And, and that's what we see in Hebrews chapter 1. It says this, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run. Say run. Run. I hate running. Any, any friends out there? Do we have any runners out there? You love to run. Amen. We'll pray for you after service. But it says to run the race with perseverance that's marked out for our life. It, 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 it begins with saying, listen, there's, there's a couple things that I want you to do. I, I want you to throw off everything that hinders you and the sin that so easily entangles you. And I want you to run. And then I want you to run. I want you to run somewhere. Not anywhere, but I want you to run into your destiny. I want you to run into your future. I want you to run into your dreams. I want you to run into your relationships. I want you to run into your prosperity. I want you to run into your blessings. I want you to run into your forgiveness. And, and if not careful, instead of running into what God has us, we get, we, we get stuck in where our world is saying that we are. You know, one of the fun things about kids in, in Chug Church today, and they're all hyper, they're all excited, they're all having fun, and they were watching a video when I came in, and, 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 and they're like, we have Captain America! It was so funny, because kids were like, yeah! And then I heard a kid go, that's not Captain America, that's Pastor Dave! I'm like, shut up, kid. This is my moment. We'll be, we'll be trying to, you know... Rain on my life right now. I've been waiting for this moment a long time, buddy. And, and, and if not careful, in humanity, we lose that excitement about life and the little things. We're, we're so worried about the big things that aren't happening, we, we can forget about the little things that are happening, what God is doing, what God is moving, what God is doing in our life that we begin to celebrate, and, and it says that we throw off everything that hinders us. Everything. Not, not something, but if you've ever ran with a backpack, you know if you drop the backpack, it's a lot easier to run. If you've ever weighed 160 pounds, and now you weigh 
a little more than 160 pounds, you realize that if you could just throw off some of this stuff, you, there would be a little float to you, a little step to you, a little run in your life. And, and, and it's true in life that sometimes we begin to collect the baggage of our life. And it weighs us down where we don't have that step. We don't have a skip. We're just trying to muster up a smile sometimes. A hello, a good morning. Because we feel like there is a disappointment of, of moving. There's not an easement of, of, of traveling forward. And, and so God is saying, hey, why don't you throw off everything that hinders you and the sin that so easily... I find that scripture amazing because God's speaking here and he says, hey, no, I get it. I realize your humanity. I know there are some sins in your life that are easily going to entangle your life. You ever felt like sinning is easy? I have. Sometimes living right is a lot harder than just living wrong. Mm -hmm. Listen, I don't have to work on sinning. I don't have to work on getting a bad attitude in the car. I have to work on not. I have to begin to develop my life because in my humanity, it's easy to cross the lines and make me feel good instead of allow God to, uh, allow my life to make Him look good. But it's a discipline. And God is saying, hey, therefore, since you, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, what is it saying? You are surrounded by people that have gone on before you, saints, Individuals that love God. And we're not just talking about Moses, Elijah, uh, Elisha, and, and David. We're not talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're not talking about the Apostle Paul. We're talking about people in our own lives that have lived a godly life and have set a motion for your family, set a motion for where you're going. That there are those that have already been through life and they can tell you that what they've gone through that God could take them through everything that they were going to navigate. Even in their greatest worry, even in their darkest moment, now, in hindsight, they say, no, God was with me every moment of the day. David, at the end of his life, said, I, I was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken. There is an attitude and an anticipation of what God is doing in our life. And then at the end of that, that chapter... It goes on, it says, at that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate that removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably. Acceptable. God acceptable with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Yeah. Hebrews 29. Yeah. For our God is a consuming fire. You know, if you look at the scripture, what it speaks about is Deuteronomy. In the book of Deuteronomy, God comes and shakes our world. It's, it's on a mountain called Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai was always on fire. The presence of God lived there. It was on fire. People looked there uh, in, in, in Deuteronomy and Exodus and Deuteronomy and Numbers. And, and they, were, they were in awe of who God was. But just because they were in awe of who God was doesn't mean they followed who God was. And God is speaking in Hebrews to a, a story in Deuteronomy that God shook. A, a world. And, and the moment that he shook the world was when he presented the law to humanity. When the Ten Commandments came on Mount Sinai. When, 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 when Moses took the Ten Commandments and God showed up and wrote with his hand in stone. But in the New Testament, God says, I don't write on stone anymore. I write on flesh, the hearts of people. And, and you've got to get a depiction of what is happening and, and a mental photo of where God was and where God is, where God is talking about that he began to shake Israel, he began to shake their bondage, he began to shake their discomfort, he began to shake their struggles, he began to shake their future, he began to shake what was happening in their life. Why? Because he wanted to dissolve the shakeable and make them unshakable. Amen. 
And I'm telling you, God's passion is still the same for you today. That things in life shake us. It was funny, we were watching TV and we were laughing at the weight shaker. Have you ever seen this thing? It's a weight you shake. And so Cameron and I were at Big Five and we're laughing. We're like, hey, the weight shaker. And we're all joking around. And I said, all right, man, let's see who can shake this thing the best. And so we started shaking this thing. And in about, I don't know, 20 or 30 seconds, the shaking wasn't funny anymore. <laughs> it seemed easy at the beginning, but now, man, it's, it keeps adding up. It keeps building. It keeps, it keeps producing tension. And, and, and what's happening is it's not only is it producing tension, but it's building strength and stability. The same is true in your life. When God begins to shake up your life, when situations or circumstances begin to shake up your life. Maybe when you're not even following God, but God starts shaking up your life. Uh, there's a few people can tell you when they didn't know God, God was shaking their life to get them to the knowledge of who He was. Because a lot of times we find God in our shaking. We find God in our breaking. We find God in our moments of struggle, not in our moments of mountaintop. And God is speaking and, and, and speaking to Israel, but in Hebrews, He's speaking to us. And He's saying that the fire of God is speaking of the power of God to make all things new, to consume the old and create a newness in your life. The fire of God in the Old Testament was to bring purity to the hearts of people. That was the, 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 the metaphor, the, 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 the type, the shadow of what God wanted to do in, in the lives of people. The, their scriptures. And I, I want you to look on your handout in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5 through 8. That the fire of God brings purity and strength to our lives. What is the fire of God? Well, in the Old Testament, there was literal fire. Literally, there was fire that consumed the sacrifice on Mount Carmel. There was fire in the tabernacle that consumed the sacrifices that the priests brought into the tabernacle. But in our lives, it's the fire is the Holy Spirit in our life. It's Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God in our life that begins to develop. And the fire of our life will say, don't do that. The fire in the life will say, stop those things. The fire in the life will say, hey, you, you need to begin to add this to your regimen. You need to remove some items. The fire of God begins to bring a purity to, to your life. Because what I realize about God is that His grace is sufficient in my life. Yes. I, Isaiah, I like him because God shows up in Isaiah's life and, and, and he starts out in verse 5. He says, woe to me, I cried. That's not a good way. What is Isaiah saying? Isaiah is telling God, God, I know you love me, but I don't know if you know me. I don't know if you know where I've been. I don't know if you've known what I've done. I don't know if you've known what I've gone through. I don't know if you know my heart. Because he says, woe to me, I cried. I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty, God showed himself to, to, to Isaiah in this moment. It was the call of Isaiah. Verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who shall go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. Amen. Can I tell you something? God is speaking to your life. Yes. No, He is. Whether you realize it or not, I'm here to tell you that God is speaking to your life. He is speaking to your future. He is speaking to your issues. He is speaking to wherever you're at, whatever moment. Isaiah gets caught in a moment. And Isaiah says, just like all of us would say, God, you want to use me? I think you got the wrong guy. But God says, no, it's not your job to make you clean. It's my job. It's not your job to keep a list. It's my job. And he says that he took a coal from the fire of the altar and he brought it to Isaiah and he said, I'm going to make all things new today. I'm going to make all things new. I'm going to purify your life. 
Watch it because it's a picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who came the, from the altar. Death, resurrection overcame and came in our lives and, and brought from the grave, brought from the cross the fire of His Holy Spirit to say, no, 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 listen, I'm going to make all, thing, all things new in your life. I, I'm going to begin to let a holy fire start in your life. It, it says in... In, in, in Hebrews, that our God is a consuming fire. Yes. It, it says that our God is consuming. He's not just a fire that is, that is staying lit, but He, he consumes all things. Yes. That whatever is in His way becomes consumed. Not destroyed, consumed. There's three Hebrew children we look in the Old Testament that in their life and in their, in their journey, they were at a place where... King Nebuchadnezzar, who brought captivity to Israel, said, you're going to bow and serve me. And there was three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that said, we're not going to serve you. We're not going to serve you. We're going to serve God. So the king said, this is what we're going to do. Either you're going to bow or I'm going to throw you in the fire. But what he didn't know is the fire was going to make them, not break them. What he didn't know is God was shaking their life, but they were standing when everyone was shrinking. They were moving forward when everyone else was taking a step backward, and they were moving into the destiny of their life. They didn't realize that the fire was going to create a destiny. They thought the fire was going to kill them. But their words to the king was this, whether we die or God rescues us, it doesn't matter to us. We know who God is, yes. and we're going to stand for the one true God. Yes. See, that's a powerful statement in your life. I don't know if God is going to heal me or not, but I know this, God's still God. I don't know if He's going to save my marriage or not, but I know that God is still the one true God. I don't know if He's going to save me from the fire, but He's going to save the fire from me. I don't know how it's all going to work, but I know that God, I'm going to serve Him. I'm not going to serve Him because what I get from Him. I'm going to serve Him because of who He is. That He's the creator of my life, my destiny, my hope, my peace, my forgiveness. And when He comes into my life, He brings a purity. He brings a fire that brings a strength in my life. Because those who God calls, God qualifies. I know that's an old school label, but it's still true. Can I tell you who God calls? All men. All women. I'm not called. You're called. Listen, we think the call is about ministry. It has nothing to do about ministry. It has to do with destiny. It doesn't have to do with my ministry. It doesn't have to do that I'm a pastor. It has to do that I'm a Christian, that I'm a Christ follower. And Christ said, when I called you and you said, yes, Jesus, come into my life, be my Lord and Savior, then I'm going to anoint you and I'm going to prepare you for your future. I'm going to develop the strengths and the gifts and the abilities in your life so that you can win in every area of your life. I'm going to put a strength in you that is unshakable. I'm going to stir up something in you that you're going to be able to navigate and forgive like you've never been able to forgive. You're going to forgive people you said you'd never forgive. And people are going to forgive you that you thought you they would never forgive you. And we come to a place where God is moving in our life. Yeah. There's a story in Matthew chapter 12, verse 9 through 14. And, and, and the story isn't really about the man of the hour that Jesus heals. The story is about the church that is trying to trap relationship with religion. Because religion will always give you a list of rules. It will tell you how to dress or not dress. It will tell you how to live or not live. It will tell you how to look or not look. It, it will tell you, and, and many times in our life, we have a set of rules. I have a set of rules in my life. It was funny because my wife, was, I was cracking up yesterday because I was telling her of our good friends that just... Their kids went and got their ears pierced, which isn't a big deal to me. I could care less. Not my kid. Like, pierce his nose, his ears, his belly button. You pierce whatever you want. It's your kid. And, 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 and so I was telling him how these guys, these two kids, they got these diamond studs in both ears. And I'm just like, I don't know why. I find it, I'm glad they did it. Because every time I think of Christian and Derek with these John Derrick with these earrings, I just laugh. I don't care that they did it. I just can't wait to see him because I think 
These two little skinny white kids are going to look so funny with these big old diamond studs in their ears. And so, so Pastor Chantel's like, well, I'll tell you one thing, Karen's not getting any earrings. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. No one said Karen was. I said Christian and John Derrick. Well, I don't know. I don't know. But they can get what they were. I don't know what, what they're thinking. But i tell you what I'm thinking. Cam's not getting any earrings right now. And I'm like, who cares? Uh, I was like, no, really. Tell us how you feel. <laughs> and, and, and she doesn't. I said, it's funny how we grow up and things attach themselves to us. Because earrings or lack of earrings doesn't mean God or not God. That's right. Can I tell you what I have a hard time with? You'll be shocked by this. I have a hard time wearing jeans on Sunday morning. Yeah. Why? Because I grew up, if you wore jeans, you were going to hell. So I never wanted to go to hell, so I never wore jeans at church. I just never got, I could wear jeans everywhere else, but I can't wear jeans at church, huh? You know, it was, it was a weird thing, but to this day, I mean, sometimes on Sunday morning, I will have jeans on at my house. I'm wearing these jeans. I'll start talking myself into wearing jeans. And, and obviously, we don't care if you wear jeans. But I realize that isn't a conviction in my life. It's a condition in my life. And it's okay. It's not that it's right or wrong. I don't think God's like, man, he's going to be anointed today. He's got slacks on. And those are some nice slacks, Dave. <laughs> it's going to be powerful. You put a tie on, bro. You might catch that place on fire. <laughs> I remember it's so funny because I remember when I was a youth pastor begging my pastor in the summer. You know, I don't know about you, but if you've been in Tucson just about a week, you realize that the summer is from hell here. And I remember asking, listen, Pastor, can we just not wear a tie? I'll still wear a jacket. Just a nice shirt, a sweet jacket, some nice... No. You don't you show up with that tie. And I was like, all right. Now I can wear whatever I want to wear, and I'm still like, oh, God, I don't think I can wear these jeans. I'm having a dilemma over nothing. And sometimes we worry about the nothing when we should be worrying about the something. And, and, and there's some religious people that gather in Matthew and they say, going on from that place, he went into their synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They're mad at Jesus because Jesus is having a breakout of people, lives being changed, and they don't want to change, but they don't want him changing others. They don't want him making their religion look bad out of his relationship. Jesus is rescuing the lost. They're looking dignified and religious, but they're not changing lives. So they want to stop what he's doing because what he's doing, making them look bad at what they're doing. And so they begin to pull out the law. They begin to break out the rules of church. Jesus, hold on. Is it legal? I mean, can you wear jeans at church? Can you heal on the Sabbath? Think about what they're saying. Their whole life is to help people, but they're saying we cannot help people on this day because it's God's day. Yet God's day is every day, and every day God wants to help people. And yet, we become religious in helping people. Well, I'll help them if they want to help themselves. Well, they can't help themselves. That's why you need to help them. Well, I'll, I'll help if, if they follow this criteria. And I think it's good not to enable people, but to help people. I, I get that. But, but that's not what the, what the religious people were saying of the day. They were saying, hey, hey, we want, we, we want to make you look bad, so we're going to pull out what everyone knows is right and make you look like you're wrong. And when the church does that, it closes its doors to the lost and makes a security for people that have always known God that are comfortable with how God has done it in their life, but they don't want to open their small heart to how God wants to do it in someone else's life. Yeah. And as a church at Cornerstone, we've always got to be open to what God wants to do in the other in lives of other people. 
in the lives and the hearts of individuals. And, and he said to them, verse 11, if any one of, excuse me, if any of you have a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. Listen, just as sound, just as perfect as the other. In other words, he got balance back in his life. Amen. Jesus spoke to him. You know, I have a good friend that his father-in-law has a withered arm. And what's amazing about him is I never knew he had a withered arm for years. I, I never knew it. Actually, someone had to tell me it. Derek said, well, you know, my father-in-law, he has a withered arm. I said, he does? Are you sure? He looked at me like, yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> But you know what I realized when I saw him again? That he became a professional at turning the right way, at hiding, at shadowing, at, 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 at not allowing people to see the withered area of his life. He, he became um, an expert at how he positioned his body and how he talked to people, how he shook their hand, how he kept eye contact, that you didn't see the withered part of his life. Until we went and played golf. And then it was obvious that he had a withered arm. Wow, Derek was right. I thought Derek was lying. Because it is withered. And his golf swing isn't whole. It's different. It's, it's, it, it, it's, it's not quite as strong as it should be. And, and as I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about how God says this consuming fire comes and it purifies and strengthens and builds our life, I thought how easy it is to have a withered place in our life. A withered moment in our life that, 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 that we have learned to hide, conceal. We have learned how to spiritually say the right thing so... We take people off guard of what's really happening in our heart. We have learned the right religious things to speak about so that people don't know the sin that we're struggling with, the weakness of our life. Mm -hmm. That God says, well, I know you're weak. I know that sin easily entangles you, but it's in your weakness that you find my strength. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to talk about his strength. We want to talk about our strength. And we want to hide and we want to compensate in areas so no one sees the dark places of our life. No one sees the pain. No one sees the hurt. No one sees the struggle. They just are set. We position ourselves so they see what we want them to see. But yet God looks through. God looks through what we want Him to see. God looks past the, 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 the outward. He looks on the inward. And too many times we carry these, these things around in our life. Mm -hmm. And we, we overcompensate. We get stronger on one side because we're weaker on this side. So, so, so we, we, we want people to know that we're strong. You ever met someone that acts so strong and the strength of their life isn't that they're strong, it's that they feel very weak because of the abuse in their life? So that every time anyone comes at them, they got to come straight back in their face. Why? Because they have a withered part of their life. They're not balanced. They're emotional. They're tossed. They're back and forth. One moment they're on top of the world, and one the next moment they're back. One moment they're believing God for great things, and the next moment they can't believe God for anything. One moment they believe that they have a great confidence in who they are, and the next moment they're insecure about everything they're about. Why? Because there's not a balance that God is in the business of completely, listen, completely restoring just as sound as the other. God says, I'm going to make the withered the new. And I think too many times in our life and in the church, the withered area of our life have so much shame, so much struggle in our life that 
No one wants to show the withered areas of their life. No one. No one wants the withered area of their life to become public. I don't know, I think about this story and I think about Jesus saying, what about this guy with the withered hand? The guy's got his hand tucked into his, his coat. Talking to me? Yeah, you with the withered hand. Thanks a lot, Jesus. No one knew it was withered until you just came along. No one knew my, my life wasn't. Maybe he didn't even realize the, 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 the hurt or the lack of, of, of movement in his life because of his condition. Why? Because he just became used to having it. So he compensated. He became used to the pain. We become used to the struggle. We begin used to the shame. We become used to hiding it. We become used to camouflaging it. We become used to smiling. We become used to covering it up. But we know it's withered. We know it's withered. We know that it's not what it should be. That our life isn't going where it should be going. That it keeps reminding us of where we've been instead of pushing us to where we're going. And Jesus comes on the scene and says, no, no, no. I'm going to restore it. I'm going to restore. I'm a healer of all things. Yes. Today I want you to watch this video because God makes beautiful things out of our life. It's a powerful video. You know, because God makes beautiful things. I, I want to read you a scripture in closing today. It's Isaiah chapter 61, verses 2 and 3. It says this, To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead instead of a spirit of despair and they will be called oaks of righteousness a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor that they make that he replaces beauty for ashes joy for sorrow that God replaces and that's why I love this video because there was a picture of looking at the picture of how they deemed who they were, who they called themselves, maybe life called themselves, conditions called themselves, struggles begin to call them. And there was a portrait that they had painted. But then all of a sudden they become enlightened of the portrait that God is painting about their life. They got to a place where they begin to see maybe how someone else saw them. Someone else viewed them. Someone else perceived them. And I'm going to ask you today to just bow your head and close your eyes. And you are here today. And your pain has tried to imprison you. But God hasn't called it to imprison you. He's called it to build you. That you feel like your past is haunting you. That you're just one step past being pulled right back. But God says that your life is free. And when it's free, it's free indeed. That you're on the run. But God's about to change it from on the run from something to on the run to something. From something to something. Because God is passionately in love with your life. God is uncontrollably running after your heart. And you're here today with your head bowed, your eyes closed. And you say, Pastor Dave, no longer, no longer will I live this way. No longer will I view myself with condemnation. But I'm going to declare over my life that I'm a new thing. That I'm going in a new way.
with a new heart, with a new relationship with Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ makes all things new. Can I tell you something? Today, you have walked around with that withered area of your life long enough. You have walked around with that hurt long enough. The shame of your past has haunted you long enough. The struggles that you have allowed in your life and has easily entangled your life is going to get thrown off, cast away, and you're going to run. You're going to run with the perseverance for the race that's marked out for you. You're not going to walk. You're not going to hesitate. You're going to run into the fullness of what God has for you. But you're here today. You are here today. And you know that you need freedom. You need a new hope. You need a new peace. You need maybe some new faith. Maybe it's your spiritual life. You've been, you've been fighting, but it just seems like it's been withering. Maybe it's a relationship that has seemed like it's withering instead of growing. That your motivation, your dreams are withering. And you may feel like you're withered, but I want to tell you today that you're worthy. I want to tell you today that you're worthy. I want to tell you today that God believes in you, that God loves you, that God, that Jesus Christ died for your life. He died for your salvation. He died because He wanted to make the items of your life that were withered the same balance you, strengthen you, excel you, develop you and you're here today and you say you know what Pastor